Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 10 of the Regato Podcast, a show featuring academics, authors, artists, and people who challenge the way we think and how to take action. In the last episode, we learned from Dr. Amy Jill Levine at Vanderbilt University and Dr. Mark Brettler at Duke University about the importance for all of us to understand how different religious traditions interpret the Bible. And we spent some time talking about their brand new book called The Bible With and Without Jesus, how Jews and Christians read the same stories differently. And as mentioned in the last episode, this is the book you're going to want to have on hand when studying the Bible because it provides fascinating insights into different ways to understand popular biblical stories from both Christian and Jewish perspectives. In today's conversation, we're going to learn from Dr. Levine and Dr. Brettler about different perspectives on the doctrine of original sin, how we pick and choose what biblical laws to follow, and examples of monotheism and polytheism in the Old and New Testaments. This next half hour is packed with awesome perspectives on how to understand our Bibles. Here's our conversation. And you know, and that brings up another question because there are these very mysterious, odd passages like that one in Genesis 6 where you have the angels or the sons of God being with human women and then giants are kind of born, Genesis says. And there are these passages that are like this. And I sit, I sit there, I'm like, I'm not even sure what to do with that. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, how else do you explain giants? I mean, we know from other biblical passages that the God of Israel is viewed as, you know, a good example of that is the dedication of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. God is sitting on a kisei ram vinta, on a huge throne. Well, I'm not imagining a tiny deity sitting on a huge throne. That and other passages suggest that God is huge. So, you know, if huge angel, if huge angels, you know, because they sort of have to be near God, they're in the same uh, orb or sphere, cohabit with humans, of course you'll get giants. Do you have a better explanation? So many like funny, odd things like that. Um, and uh, you mentioned also, um, monotheism. And that's also a, another quick question that I had. I don't know if it's a quick question, but it's around, um, as we look at maybe the Israelites, like going back to Genesis during that, that period when it was written, would, would we say that Jews were monotheists or that they had like a, they believed in multiple gods? Because I, I think even within the commandment of like, you shall have no other gods before me, maybe infers that there are these other gods that are around, but I am the one God. I was wondering if maybe you can come to comment on polytheism versus monotheism in the early kind of tribal nations of Israel. There is some slippage in your question between the Bible and ancient Israelite that I think it's really important for your listeners to understand. Uh, the Bible is an ancient Israelite text. There are not a whole lot of other ancient Israelite texts that are preserved from this particular period. But uh, it's like taking a, a single American text. This represents America. I know, what text do you want to choose? I mean, do you want to choose Faulkner? Do you want to choose Thomas Wolfe? Do you want to choose Salinger? I mean, each of those texts is going to represent a very different cross-section of America. So the Bible represents a cross-section, which I'm going to call somewhat tautologically, biblical Israel. Ancient Israel was much broader than biblical Israel uh, in its beliefs. We largely know this on the basis of archaeological information and various types of polemics that you have in the Hebrew Bible itself. So I would not, number one, I would not generalize from biblical Israel to all of ancient Israel, where I'm sure that ancient Israel was much more polytheistic than biblical Israel was. But secondly, given that the Bible is a collection, or even the Hebrew Bible is a collection, or especially even a collection of collections of collections, you know, it has a tremendous amount of diversity in it. So there are some texts which are, let me call them, uh, very monotheistic. Uh, the late Tikva Grimmer Kensky used to call them we talk about radical monotheism in these texts. Uh, one of them in Deuteronomy, actually soon it will be the end of the festival of Sukkot. This is a verse from Deuteronomy recited during Simchat Torah, 
the rejoicing of the law part at the end of the at the end of Sukkot. Ata or ita lada ki adonai hu ha Elohim in od bilvado. It was proven to you to know that God, that the Lord is the God. Uh, there are no others beside him. Okay, that is a super duper radical monotheistic. Let's look it up. Sorry, Deuteronomy four thirty five is what that is. On the other hand, you have texts like in the Song of the Sea, in Exodus chapter fifteen verse eleven. You know, Milchamocha ba'ivim Adonai, who is like you among the gods, O Lord. Now, different translations fudge that, like they'll say, but among the celestials and so forth. But clearly that is a text that is assuming that there are a variety of deities. I mean, the word that is used is El, which is a standard word in biblical Hebrew for a god with a lowercase g. But it is assuming that uh, even though there's a multiplicity of deities, the God of Israel is incomparable. And by the way, many biblical texts suggest that it is just fine for non-Israelites to worship other gods. And that's the way you quoted from the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. So it's not at all surprising that that should acknowledge the presence of other deities. So, as I to summarize, because that was a long answer to a short question. Sorry about that. The Bible, the Hebrew Bible itself, has a diversity of views concerning monotheism and extents of monotheism within it. And the, if you move from the Hebrew Bible to ancient Israel, be careful not to generalize and to assume that everyone in ancient Israel you know, was walking around with their Hebrew Bible. <laughs> that was their textbook for belief at that point. I was wondering if I could take this into the New Testament um, because this issue of monotheism versus polytheism, or how many supernatural beings there are, is also an issue in the first century, so that even the monotheists are sort of polytheists, because there are other supernatural beings running around. The idea is you just don't worship them. Satan is a supernatural being. And when Jesus encounters Satan in that temptation narrative, the extended one that we have in Matthew and Luke, and he says, you know, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you worship me. You know, wonder if that is that a bona fide offer? Is he really in charge of them? In Colossians, um, when Paul talks about um, thrones and dominions and rulers and powers and all these things in heaven and earth, he's not talking about just the Roman emperor. He's talking about supernatural beings who were out there. Um, there are passages, for example, in the Epistle to the Hebrews, which I have to tell my Jewish, my Christian students that Jews don't read because the Epistle to the Hebrews is actually in the New Testament. Um, the author has to has to go out of his way to explain that Jesus is not just a super duper angel. He's he's of a far superior quality. Why? Because some people thought he was a super duper angel because angels are they're floating around out there literally and they're heavenly beings. And people, when they see them, might fall down in front of them as if they're worshiping them. So even in the first century, um, the world is replete with supernatural beings. And the question is, where does your loyalty go? Which one are you supposed to worship? I have a colleague who has created a very clever term to help untangle this issue, qualitative versus quantitative monotheism. So really, in the case of both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, when we're talking about monotheism, we are really talking about qualitative monotheism. But, you know, this quantitative monotheism, you know, we're not talking about quantitative monotheism because these other supernatural beings are understood to have a real existence and some real power. I love that. What a, what a great way to put it, qualitative versus quantitative. And thank you for correcting me. Sometimes when I ask questions, I, I slip a little bit. I'm not quite sure exactly how to phrase it. So thank you for correcting okay. me. <laughs> Please continue to do that because I, I want to make sure that I get this right. And it's, it's super helpful to hear that, that perspective. One of the other storylines that you uh, write about is uh, the, the, the idea of original sin and how uh, the Christian tradition will take that and run with it. Um, and we especially see it in the New Testament with Paul's letters about 
then and what that means and how that impacts people. And then there's also the Jewish understanding of, of the sin in the garden and what that means. And I was wondering if you can maybe talk about those two different story arcs. And um, Dr. Levine, especially just the New Testament story arc of, of how Paul the Apostle and, and various others began to just talk about the result. Because even Christians, we split up on how this actually manifests itself. Is, is that Are we all responsible for Adam's sin? Or are we just uh, have corrupted natures and now uh, desire sin rather than goodness? Like there's so many different divisions on this. I would love to kind of hear your your perspective on uh, original sin. Okay, well, I'll start and then and then Mark can pick up because this is a huge topic. Um, so if you go to something like Romans chapter five, Paul, Paul talks about and I'm just going to use regular secular terminology. Adam messes everything up and the Christ comes and fixes it. So because of Adam, sin enters the world and death enters the world. Um, and because of the fidelity of Jesus, um, then death is conquered and sin is conquered and people are now back in a right relationship with God when they had been in this fractured relationship. Technical term for that is justification. So think about justified margins. Everything's now back in a right relationship. So what Adam broke, Jesus fixed. And that makes perfectly good sense. Um, and then the text will go on so that by the time you get up to the so-called pastoral epistles, First Timothy, First Timothy comes in and glosses this and said, you know what? Um, Adam was created first and then Eve. And Adam did not sin, but Eve sinned. The woman sinned and became a transgressor. So First Timothy says, you know what? It really wasn't Adam's fault, right? Um, as if in the background, uh, the author is thinking, oh, when Eve ate that fruit, because she ate first. And Genesis says she ate and she gave to the man who was with her and he ate. Um, that he realized as soon as she took that bite, oh, there, there goes immortality. There goes my, my complete relationship with the divine. And Adam, because he's such a guy, eats the fruit in solidarity with her, knowingly giving up um, uh, in corruption, going, knowingly giving up immortality. Oh, really? Right? If you read Genesis, you're not going to get that. But if you, if you read it with that particular image, you say, yeah, I can see where he gets it. So you wind up with original sin. Um, which which doesn't really get developed until Ambrose and then and then following him Saint Augustine who who formalizes the idea. Um, Augustine comes up with this idea that when Adam ate the fruit, a change was wrought in his physical body um, such that um, to do a literal translation, his seed became vitiated. In other words, his 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 DNA got got compromised, his sperm got screwed up, and therefore everybody inherits this taint of original sin because everybody is conceived with the semen that carries this marker, unless you're in the Roman Catholic tradition, in which case you have the Immaculate Conception, which means that when Mary was conceived, her father's sperm uh, was straightened out. It sounds better if you do it in Latin. <laughs> so the, I mean, so, and it makes sense. It's a logical reading. And original sin actually makes sense to me because it seems to me um, that human beings are hardwired towards selfishness, um, we're hardwired toward um, not necessarily loving our neighbor as, as we would love ourselves. We're certainly not very good at loving the stranger, um, let alone, as Jesus would put it, loving the enemy. Um, and there are a lot of things we do that, that strike me as, as not quite in line with what the divine would have intended. So the idea of original, sense makes, original sin makes a great deal of sense. But the Jewish tradition does not go there. Um, we, when we read Genesis 3, which is the so-called fall narrative, the word fall is not used. The word sin is not used because sin doesn't enter the, the vocabulary of the Bible until Cain and Abel in the next chapter. So what happens with the Jewish tradition is instead of getting this original sin where there's, there's an irreparable breach between God and humanity that only Jesus can fix, we note that when Adam and Eve leave Eden, God goes with them and God is always with the people and there's no irreparable breach. And then the Jewish tradition then has various ways of understanding how what happened with Adam and Eve impacts us. Well, let me pick up on that. Because in a sense, original sin and the term, which you put in quotation marks, fall of man, is definitely not part of the Jewish view of Genesis chapters 2 and 3. But if I were to read the following verse to many of my Jewish friends, and ask them to identify it, uh, I would probably trick them. 
That is Psalm 51, verse 5 in the Hebrew version. It's Psalm 51, verse 7. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. Now, please note, that, that is original sin. Read that person is saying, and this is not a mistranslation, I was born with sin. So in some sense, some sense, the notion of original sin is very much part of the Hebrew Bible. But if you were to press me, I could not find, I would not be able to find many other verses which agree with that verse from Psalm 51. It is a minority opinion within the Hebrew Bible, or especially very rarely within the Hebrew Bible. You, know, you have some similar notions. For example, uh, before God, when God is about to destroy people with the flood of Noah, God says that people's evil inclinations are bad all the time and so forth. So you have a handful, maybe two hands full of texts that express that. But this is a wonderful case. And we show a lot of other cases like this in the Bible with and without Jesus, where a notion that is a peripheral notion within the Hebrew Bible, for whatever sets of reason is picked up in the early Christian community, sometimes in the New Testament, or sometimes, as AJ just noted, in the New Testament, or a little bit later in the early church fathers, and becomes magnified and magnified. So something that there's another way of putting this idea is that, yeah, in some way, Jews and Christians really do share the notion of original sin. But in the Hebrew Bible, it is a minority notion. It is not part of the Eden narrative. While in the Christian tradition, it, become, it eventually becomes a majority notion. It becomes very, very central to Christian faith and belief in a way in which it does not in Judaism. So material shared and places where we differ. It also creates a different type of anthropology. So a number of, of my Christian students talk about um, existing in a sense of brokenness for which they need the Christ to reconcile them. Um, their services are, and, and this may resonate with you in your church background, um, we are all sinners, you know, we are unworthy, uh, but Christ sacrificed himself for us, and therefore we should give glory to God. Right? So the Christian narrative is one from brokenness to reconciliation. That's not so much the Jewish narrative, right? The yeah. Jewish narrative is we're actually pretty fabulous. We're a little bit lower than the angels. God loves us. And when we screw up, and we will screw up, right? Golden calf was not one of our better moments. Um, when we screw up, there are mechanisms because we're not perfect and we're not supposed to be perfect, right? We're human beings. Um, we have the Torah, we have the, the commandments uh, to help get us back on the right path, to, to turn us from, from the, the wrong way to the right way. We have our community that's supposed to support us. Uh, that verse that, that Christians know in Leviticus about love your neighbor as yourself in Leviticus 19.18 uh, right before that, it says, if you see your neighbors doing something wrong, you go say something to your neighbor, because that's a sign of love, is that you reprove your neighbor, the, the Hebrew is tohika. You repu reprove your neighbor, and that's a sign of love, like parental correction. Um, so we don't begin from a stance of brokenness. And when on the Sabbath, when we come into worship, we spend most of our time praising God, and not a whole lot of time talking about how sinful we are. Very, very different in a church context. Except mm. for two days ago, which was Yom Kippur, and all of that gets shoved into, into a single day. But, and here again, it's really important, you know, we might start at least with that day with the same assumption, but, you know, redemption, and I'm not even sure I want to use that term, because it doesn't quite feel like a Jewish term to me, that does not happen through the Christ, but happens to each individual, each community, and, each, and the community as a whole, you know, mending her or his ways and finding the right path back to Torah. It happens through uh, tishuvah, to use the Hebrew term, through, through 
personal and communal repentance in Judaism. Dr. Levina, I love how you just mentioned Sabbath. And that is, it's interesting when we look at the law. Um, I think I think most Christians will, will just say that we hold to the Ten Commandments and they're very important laws of God. But what's very interesting is that I think we're very we very much pick and choose the laws that we really want to um, focus on. For example, Sabbath day, the commandment says that we should be working six days and on seventh is a resting period. And that's right up next to the other very serious commandments about thou shall not kill. And so, like, you have these very serious commandments. I'm oh, sorry. Thank you. Thou shall not murder. Thou shall not lie. Honor your father and mother. Like, all very, like, great laws. And right next to it, you have Sabbath day, which I think most Christians, we don't really follow it, that particular commandment. I was wondering maybe you can comment on, like, how we kind of kind of pick and choose which ethic, which laws we want to follow. It's a different system. Um, in the Jewish system, there are there are commandments. And then once we start getting Jews commenting on the commandments, then you have all sorts of variations. So um, if, if you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, then then it requires rabbinic literature to tell us what constitutes work. And how do you know work when you see it? Um, work for one person is a pleasure for somebody else. Right? Um, so then you have the idea, well, God ceased from the act of creation. So maybe work is to create something new. Um, and then to appreciate what you have without having to do something else. But we actually have an entire structure to tell us 24-7, this is work and this is not work. Here's how you follow the commandments. And that's why in the New Testament, Jesus and the Pharisees are, are debating, well, what exactly does this mean? When Jesus debates Sabbath observance, that's such a Jewish thing to do. Because Jews have been debating Sabbath observance since Moses came down the mountain and said, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy and what, and don't work. And one Jew looks at another and says, what constitutes work? And now you have two synagogues. So I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but not much. So, but Jews have these laws, so we know what to do. In the same way, if you're in, uh, uh, more or less the same way, if you are an American citizen, there are laws. There are more laws in the books of the United States than in the entire Jewish tradition. But you know how to be a citizen. You know how fast you're supposed to drive. Um, you know what's legal to, to grow in your garden and what isn't, depending upon what state in which you live and so on. Right? And sometimes you debate those laws. That's why you have lawyers. And that's why we have the Supreme Court. In Christianity, it's not based on law. It's based on faith. So the idea from Paul is not that you follow the law to make you good, because the law doesn't actually make you good anyway. It just keeps you on the right path. Um, you have this faith in, in the Christ. And for Paul... There should be a transformation in you such that you naturally do good things. So I'm about to cite um, I'm, I'm about to cite a Protestant because I think this is not an, a totally incorrect reading. Uh, Martin Luther, reading Paul, said, "Good works don't make a good man, but a good man bears good fruit." So for Paul, once you're once you're in this Christ, once you have accepted the Christ as your Lord and Savior then somehow you should be compelled to do good works because you've moved from the realm of sin into the realm of grace. You've moved from the realm of Adam into the realm of Christ. The problem is people don't do that naturally, so they need laws. And that's why at the end of pretty much every Pauline epistle, every letter that Paul writes, there's this ethical section, which scholars are likely to call paranesis because it sounds important. But it was, you know, don't mistreat the poor. Don't screw around, literally. Uh, behave yourselves. Um, uh, be honest with each other. Don't take your neighbor to court. Fix things. So Jews have a legal structure to do it. Christians actually don't. And that's why the church has to develop. Do we actually look at the Ten Commandments? Which commandments do we follow? Which do we not follow? It's harder in the church. Um, if you look at the Pauline epistles, it's not clear that Paul is commending the Sabbath. You only start getting Sabbath reference in terms of new moons and feast days in Colossians, and Paul's not really happy about that. As if maybe the Sabbath was something that Gentile followers of Jesus were not supposed to do. And then eventually the church, for the most part, doesn't keep the Sabbath. It keeps what is called the Lord's Day. Different celebration. Well, I can't believe this hour has flown by, and I've been learning a ton, taking a ton of notes here. Um, I want to thank you both. Before before we go, um, I want to ask if maybe if you can share um, 
some advice, some insight for those of us who want to read our Bible critically, um, questions maybe we should be asking ourselves as we read the Bible, um, or even uh, tools or resources that we should look to um, to help us with our own uh, interpretations. Yes, read our books. <laughs> um, it, it, it's self-promoting, but but they're good books, and and they work, and we know that they work because we tried it out on church groups and synagogue groups and on our students. And then read other people's books, people who might disagree, because the more you read, the more options you will be able to have, and then make your own choice. And be always be aware of the presuppositions that you are bringing to any text including the Bible as a reader, and just be open to letting go of some of those presuppositions for a few minutes, or trying some other presuppositions on for size, and then suddenly you'll see how it becomes a much richer text. So start by saying, well, start by opening the text and reading it, mm -hmm. and then say, what does this text mean to me? What do I get out of it? And you're already ahead of the curve because you've got something, but don't stop there. Find out what it means to your neighbors or people in your own religious tradition or then to people in other religious traditions. And then over time, um, you'll never read everything. Uh, but as the rabbinic tradition says, it's not your duty to complete the task, but nor are you free to desist from it. So plow in knowing that you will never have all the answers, but you may get some and it's worthwhile. Mm. What a beautiful way to end this. And I was on the last podcast, my guest was saying that the Bible is very much a mansion to be explored. And this is exactly what you're saying. Like, ask the questions, explore, uh, engage the text, join the dialogue, and just enjoy that period. I think some, I, I started at the very beginning talking about how perplexing it is, but I think part of this, and I, Dr. Brother, I love the fact that you said, like, I think it's a good perplexing. And I think that's exactly the way we come to the Bible, like with that attitude of like, oh boy, I'm going to be joining into this conversation and I'm going to read this dialogue. I'm going to hear different perspectives. And what, what a joy and exciting moment to be able to do that. Um, so I want to thank you both for helping us to engage with the text, giving us, giving us some insight and shedding some lights on different perspectives on the Bible. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be with you. Thank, thank you. you. Your, thank you for your careful reading of that book and your wonderful questions. Thank you so much for listening to this episode with Dr. Amy Jill Levine and Dr. Mark Brettler about their book, The Bible With and Without Jesus, How Jews and Christians Read the Same Stories Differently. Next time, we're chatting with Rabbi Rachel Mikva at Chicago Theological Seminary about her new book entitled Dangerous Religious Ideas, The Deep Roots of Self-Critical Faith in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's a conversation about how religious ideas, not just extremist ones, can cause harm as well as embody important religious teachings. It's another two-part series dedicated to the importance of self-critical faith. So that's next time. Before we go, I want to share two quick takeaways from our conversation with Dr. Levine and Dr. Brettler. Number one, the Bible gives us examples of monotheism and polytheism in both our Hebrew Bible and New Testament. Biblical writers reference various supernatural beings throughout the scriptures, which reveal that these ancient authors had different ideas about the spiritual realm and how those beings interacted with people. Number two, the doctrine of original sin is complicated and it creates different biblical understandings depending on the interpretive path that we take. It's important to realize how different views on original sin impact the storyline and themes that we look for in scripture. As a Christian, my perspective on original sin has been largely influenced by Paul's writings in the New Testament and a lot by how Augustine thought about it. The Hebrew Bible and the Jewish understanding doesn't really emphasize the doctrine of original sin the way that my tradition does. It's important for us to have empathy for each other's viewpoints, as Dr. Brettler and Dr. Levine modeled for us in this conversation and also in their book. So that leads us to this episode's question. Dr. Brettler and Dr. Levine modeled for us how to have empathy for each other's biblical viewpoints. What are ways that you can work on having more empathy for other people's biblical viewpoints? Let me know by messaging me on Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter at Delgado Podcast. Oh, and if you found this podcast helpful in any way, please let me know by rating the show on iTunes and or leaving a comment. Your vote can help the show get more visibility. Thank you so much, and we'll chat next week. Take care.